Everybody here, do you guys kind of, does anybody here not know my story or my spiel or what I'm all about and all that stuff? I know. Okay, so a couple people. Um, I'll just give you just a quick background story real quick. Started in 02, uh, roofed houses with my father before that. Um, got in, I was 20 years old. Um, told I was too young. You know, back then, young, it was only older people, really. But the new generation was kind of, I guess I was kind of on the front end of younger people getting in and really making a name for yourself. So it took me eight months to make my first sale. I was roofing and doing real estate at the same time, trying to figure it out. Uh, made my first sale, started selling two a month for a while. And then we got into 03, 04, when the market exploded. Made a lot of money, uh, and I was only 23 or so. So when I made all that money, I had no idea what to do with it. So I was buying all kinds of stuff I shouldn't buy and investing in stuff the wrong way. I was borrowing money to buy properties, flip properties and stuff. So when the market crashed, I lost everything. Um, over a matter of about, I guess a year, uh, I completely went through every, everything I had uh, just to try to stay afloat because I had so much, I had like a million and a half worth of debt on properties that I was paying notes on. Uh, so I was just trying to trying to survive. And, and everybody was saying, just give it two years, give it two years, and two years would go by and they'd say, give it two more years. And so it was just kind of the never ending crash. So I went to nothing, really negative, went bankrupt and all that stuff. Went back to roofing houses, worked on an oil rig, for a year in 07, from the beginning of 07 to the end of 07, in Hattiesburg, uh, drove up there every other week, a week on, week off. So during that time when I lost everything and I went back to roofing, I mean, I, here I was thinking I was re retired, like I was done, I was gonna be a multimillionaire and my life was done. I lose everything. So to go, to go from that to back to roofing, and, and at that point I hadn't roofed houses for um, five years or so. So I wasn't in the roofing shape I was in, you know, going back, I had to, it took me a while to get my body to get used to hard labor again. And it was just a real humbling experience to have to go back, backwards in life. Um, but the way I felt then was the same way I felt when I was a teenager roofing or when I made it big or when I lost everything or when I started coming back. Or right now, like I, I, it, it feels the same. Like I don't, I don't feel any different because my mind is always trying to go to that next level and trying to figure out the next thing. And you know, I'm just always going to work 15 hours a day. Um, it's just who I am. You know, I just love work. I love the grind. I love figuring out what works, what doesn't work. When I find something that works, I just go all in. When I find something that really works. And that's really, like, if I just had to say, just bottom line, just internally, that's really why I'm where I'm at. It's because I have that drive where I'm just so hungry for what, for trying to figure out what works. And then once I figure it out, I'm good at spotting it and then going all in with it. But during, when I was down, I read a hundred books. Uh, I, I watched agents, I studied the market. I wanted to know why I lost everything, why, you know, what did I do wrong? What decisions I made that led me to losing everything? I wanted to know, and it, I was just so curious because I knew that I was going to come back, and, and I wanted to come back stronger, and not only come back stronger, but stay back. I didn't want to go through all this again of building it up and then losing it all, building it up and losing it all. So when I lost it all the first time, I'm one of these guys that one time is all I need as far as if you teach me something, that's it. You don't have to tell me again. Um, the same thing with, with this. When, when I lost it all, it's like, okay, I'm going to figure out why. I'm going to correct it, and then I'm going to be good. So in 2008, I got laid off the oil rig and kind of forced back into real estate. But there, there was an agent in, in Orange Beach that had sold 30 properties in 06 or 07, um, and it was astonishing to me because everybody was getting out of the business. Uh, I was out of the business. 
Um, nobody, the people that were there were not selling 30 condos. So this guy was act actually helped me when I first started in real estate back in 01, 02. And so when I saw that he accomplished that during the crash, I went to him and I said, what, you gotta tell me what the secret is, what you're doing, you know? So I met with him at his house and really it, it was kind of strange because the same stuff that he taught me to do when I started was the same exact stuff he was doing then postcards, phone calls, emails, you know, all the same stuff, right? But see, what happens when the market shifts and the market crashes or changes, the, 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 the buyers and sellers change over. So what, what happens is, um, like, if you're, if you're, like right now we're in a great market and everybody's doing well, um, but it's starting to tighten up. Like transactions are lower this year from last year. Um, you know, inventory is low, prices are higher. It's harder, it's actually tougher this year than it's starting to tighten up. Well, we're, we're kind of in a transition period. And, and what happens when there's a transition or a shift or a crash is your buyers and sellers change, right? The ones that you were working with in the great market, they kind of start holding back. You know, they kind of take a step back and they don't want to do anything. They're, they see that it's shifting and they want to just put the brakes on and they want to watch. <clears throat> and what happens is, is most agents, when the buyers or sellers they're working with put the brakes on and, and they, they don't, they're, they're in denial about the market shifting, that it scares them and then they just start backpedaling until they have to get out of the business. But what they should do is just understand that we're in a shift and those same buyers and sellers that were with them when the market was coming up go away and so but there are uh, there are buyers and sellers when the market changes the, there's buy, buyers there's different buyers that emerge it's the people that want to buy when it's down right they're not they're not there when it's going up because they're waiting on it to go down and so it's a different it's totally different people and what you have to do is you have to go find those people you know my thing is is calling property owners and when, when a market's shifting we're shifting who knows if the transaction is slowing down, make it a flat year, stays flat for a couple years. Maybe it stays flat this year and goes, keeps going. Maybe it goes flat and goes down. Who knows what's going to happen. Um, but, but this year is different. We have less transactions, right? So who knows what's going to happen. But, but there, are, there are buyers and sellers. Like the sellers, when it goes down, they got to sell right now because they're in trouble. The buyers want to buy right now while the prices are down before they come back up. It creates urgency. And so that's one thing I really want to stress to you guys because with transactions being down, we could be in the middle of a shift that's, that's something that's going to happen. And it's nothing to ignore. Like, we need to be on the front end of this. Like, I'm already telling clients <coughs> that <coughs> transactions are down this year. You know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I just want you to know that transactions are down so that you can make whatever decisions you need to make based around that information. You know, I'm not trying to predict, I'm just telling you what it is as quickly as I can. I want to be the first to the market with information. If something's happening, I want to be the first one putting it out there. I'm talking to agents in my market when I call them about listings and stuff, and, I'm, and then we'll talk about the deal, and then you know, I'll say, what do you think about the market and this and that, and we'll talk, and oh, it's great, and I said, you know, what do you think about transactions being down, and they don't even know, right? Agents in the market that are selling stuff. So, if you can be on the front end, being on the front end of things, like if you bought into Facebook before it was big, you know, that was great, right? It's the same thing. When new listings and new sales happen every day in MLS, See, new agents have a little bit of advantage over, over experienced agents because experienced agents don't have the time to really study the MLS like a newer agent does and see all the new activity going on. And the newer agent can take that information and, and supply it to their clients first before anybody else. And now all of a sudden they're an expert in, the, in their clients' minds. There's all kinds of different angles you, know, you can take with this, but there's always new stuff um, it's like me trying to, you know, help agents across the world. It's like, I want to be the first to be talking about this. Transactions are down. 
What are we going to do? We need to be ready for this or that. How are we talking to our clients? Um, there's always something new. Now, no two years are going to be the same. From the year before that, 2016, you know, transactions were higher than 15. Transactions were higher in 17 than 16. You know, it's been going like this. You know, it, it was higher. So that's something to talk about. Now it's going, now the transactions. So are we hitting a, we definitely hit a ceiling on transactions that's already coming down. Are we hitting a ceiling on prices? You know, interest rates are coming up. Um, inventory is about the same. In my market, it's four months, which was the same at the same point last year. So inventory is the same, you know, transactions are down, but prices are up. So the same inventory is there, but it's at a higher price point. So I think that higher price point knocks a few buyers off the bottom. And then the, every time they increase the interest rate, it, it, it shaves a layer of buyers off the bottom, right? And so we're, it's tightening up. So where it goes from here is gonna be really interesting. I love this stuff, I love watching it and figuring it out. But, but what, is, what is really interesting to me is through all my experiences and losing it all and, and all this stuff, I realize that it doesn't matter what the market does because you know the, the, there's going to be people that want to buy when it's down and sell when it's down. There's going to be people that want to buy and sell when it's up. There's always people buying and selling. There's always closings happening in MLS. So if you get anything out of today, I want it to be that, that you don't have to be scared of the market crashing or you know that if you're going to be in real estate you know for the rest of your life if you want to be and you understand this concept then you will be because it doesn't matter what the market does you know when you when you can eliminate all the fears of markets crashing losing deals uh making calls fear is what's holding most of you back you're scared of overwhelming yourself with business because you don't want to uh, jeopardize your customer service, you're scared to get on the phone for whatever personal reasons you're scared to get on the phone about, you're, you're, you're scared about losing deals because you feel like that, you're looking at your bank account thinking that this deal was already there, but in reality that was never your deal in the first place, right? And I mean you're trying to make money off somebody else's property, right? It's their decision, it's their property. Um, it's really not your deal in the first place. The fact that you have the opportunity to do that deal is what you should be grateful for, not the fact that you did or didn't get it. But what's really amazing, and this is where I lose a lot of people, is the future time you get back when you lose a deal, that you don't have to spend on that deal anymore. Like any negative deal, like a client that unsubscribes from your weekly email, or you know somebody hung up on you while you were cold calling, or you went on a listing appointment that were interviewing three or four agents and they didn't pick you. Whatever the negative experience is, it's such an opportunity. Because you get all this future time back, number one, you learn something, number two, and just the fact that you were there in the first place means that you're getting better, right? I, I lose deals, you know? I mean, I did a video about losing a $1.2 million listing last year um, but that was a lot last year, but I lose them all the time. I had a client get mad at me that I did four deals with um, over the past two or three years we did four deals together. This was his last one out of them. He's, he's out of the market now, but he says it was the worst deal he did in 22 years. And I had to have this talk with him about, you know, and, and the title company messed up and, you know, maybe I made some bad, uh, you know, maybe I didn't handle everything just perfectly. You're not going to make everybody happy. So what I'm saying is, is you can't have any fears about any of this. The fear is what's holding you back. Calls, losing deals, markets crashing, all those are good things. Um, I feel like uh, most of you in here are probably judging your entire business based on how many appointments you get and how many listings you have and how many closings you're having. And I can't even tell you, if somebody says, Ricky, I made this many calls, I talked to this many people, I got this many emails, I've got this many listings in general, like, that doesn't tell me anything about your business, right? It tells me a little piece of it, that, but that's not the most important part to me. I, I believe that market share for a real estate agent is how many real relationships, real, Voice to voice, 
real <clears throat> human connection relationships you have with property owners in the area. Like whatever agent has the most real relationships with the most property owners in the area, you own the market share, right? Because because that's future business. You trade stocks on future earnings of companies, and I trade market share for real estate agents based on their future earnings, right? And so I feel like the real relationships with property owners is market share. Not how many closings or listings or whatever you have compared to the rest of the market. So how I judge somebody's business is, okay, how many people are you talking to per day? Because that tells me where your work ethic is, right? And then out of those people, how many are you actually connecting with that, that love you, you know, that love you forever? You know, how many are you connecting with on a lifelong relationship basis? Where are your people skills? Um, and I think, I think it goes hand in hand with judging your business on how many appointments and listings and stuff you have and having that mindset. It, it, it translates through how you're communicating with them and they can tell that that's what you're after, the listing, the deal, the appointment. And when that's all you're focused on, you sound like every other agent and they're not interested. Right, but if you approach it in, in how can I help you, right? You never ask for an appointment, a listing, a contract, a closing, a this or that, right? It's just like what can I do to help you and actually listen to what they got going on, then that goes a lot further, right? And if you can see, they've already decided when they're going to buy or sell. You're not going to talk them into it, magically say something that's going to make them do, do what you want to do to make you money. Right, they've already made the decision when they want to do it. It's your, it's not your job to talk them into it or sway them. It's your job to connect with them and be the agent that they like the most. They pick an agent based on who they like the most. Likeability is number one. Uh, maybe number two is you know production and market share and all this other stuff. But if they, but there's guys that are that have outsold me and I've went on listings over all the time because I'm more concerned with the client and what their needs are now and later in the future and their friends and family. And the ROI on that mindset and going after deals in that with that angle is far greater than trying to get a listing, trying to get an appointment and just focusing on that. They can smell it on you. My buddy calls it commission breath. When they can, they can sense that they can sense, you know, that that's what underneath. And if and if, and if you're real, you know, and they feel that, that's where you're gonna win. And so it's it's a real estate's a long term game too. Nothing. It took me eight months to make my first sale, and after my first year or two, and I made some deals, I thought back during that eight months of several situations that I could have capitalized on opportunity. They were telling me they wanted to sell, but I wasn't really picking up on the signs, you know, but that's something that just comes with experience. It just takes time to develop experience. So, um, relationships over transactions, you know, that's, that's my real big thing is that it's so much more valuable like just the trans the, the, the relationship with the person is just so much more valuable than a transaction. Um, now you need money to live, but the thing is closings are happening every day. So if you're talking to the right amount of the amount of people you're supposed to talk to, you're gonna run into some of these people that are doing stuff now. And if you approach it in, in, in a in a manner of how can I help you, then you know, and you're professional, hardworking, dependable, etc. They're gonna they're gonna be drawn to you. They're gonna want to do that deal to fix them to do today with you, right? But doing it this way, you you not only get those deals today, but you're also building this huge pipeline for the future. Because less than one percent of people that you talk to the first time want to do a deal the first time you talk to them, or thinking about doing a deal right now. Less than one percent. But and most agents live off that less than 1%. But if, if, if you're talking to 100 people, 200 people, whatever, out of the people you talk to, 20 to 
depending on your skill and your people skills, and if you really adopt this approach, like you enough to do a deal with you, they're just not ready. And that's where all the money is. It's that 20 to 30% or 40 if you're a really good per people person or 10 if you really suck, <laughs> right? But, but, but that's a lot more than less than 1%, which is what most agents, they're just going after the deal today. Who wants to do a deal today? And they're so focused on that that they just kind of throw all these other people to the side or they're just not too concerned when, when I'm even more so uh, wanting to create relationships with the people that aren't ready today, because that's far that's that's the majority of people, you know. And if you if you win them over long term, think of the ROI, the past clients, referrals, so on and so forth, right? So that's how I built my business. It took me having to lose everything and go through all that. It, it took me. It was six years in by the time I came back into real estate. You know, from the time I started making a meal, losing it all, and then getting back into real estate was a six year period. That I realized then that relationships were more valuable than transactions, but I was still like 50-50. You know, I was still going after, half of me was still going after the deal, and the other half was trying to make relationships happen. So it still took me a long time to transition to where I am now, which is 100% relationships. Like I could care less if you do a deal, if you buy something, if you cancel this listing tomorrow, whatever it is, I want, it's all you. I'm just here to help you do whatever. Um, when you accumulate clients who, know, who, who actually, when they know that you're like that, when you'll just let them out of the listing, you never pressure them, they're, they're feel comfortable with you. Likeability and comfortability are number one. So I think we wanted to do like Q&A and stuff. So that's, that's my, you know, kind of my story and biggest thoughts. I have a lot more, I could talk all day, um, but I don't know how much time we have or whatever, so I'd love to hear if you guys have any questions. How do you get your numbers to call? I mean, because I haven't been in the business that long, so I mean, how do you get the phone numbers to call? Do you just, what's the process of it? Okay, tomorrow, <clears throat> which is really cool that I'm doing this today with all you guys. Tomorrow, I'm going live on YouTube making calls at noon. I'm going to be YouTube live doing calls for an hour. I'll probably make 100 dials. I'm going to use Red X to find the numbers and Mojo to call the numbers, right? So, um, you might uh, explain what that means. What's that? Yeah, I'll explain it. Uh, if you guys want to, though, I'll be YouTube live. You can go to my YouTube subscribe, hit the bell, all that stuff, and I'll be live tomorrow. Um, okay, Red X. Red X is, it's a system. Everybody, does anybody know what Red X is? A couple people. Okay, Red X is a, it, it's theredx.com, and it's a software, right? And what it does is, it has, it has a couple different features, right? So it, it, it finds really high quality phone numbers, like, when you when you when I started in real estate, I wanted to call hundred a day. So from about five o'clock when I quit calling till nine, ten, eleven, however long it took me to look up a hundred numbers on whitepages.com, type it in, copy and paste an address, and doing all that stuff, it took me several hours to find a hundred numbers. Well, to, well, to try to find a hundred out of a hundred, I would probably find fifty, and then thirty of those are bad. 20 are good. I'll leave 15 voicemails and probably talk to four or five people. That was that was what my days looked like when I first started. Um, and it would take me all day to make those 100 calls because I'm dialing with my finger. And I'm calling the ones that are, that are not even in service too. I'm having to figure that out by calling. So it would take me all day. So I'm spending eight hours calling, another four or five looking up numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm spending 12 hours a day looking up numbers and calling people until I got some momentum going and started getting some appointments and started getting some real things happening. So in today's world, like that 12 hours or 13 or however long it took me, now takes you five minutes to find the phone numbers and another hour to hour and a half to call the 100 numbers. Um, 
the, the, the Red X, they have for sale by owner feature where they basically kind of comb the area and every day if there's a new for sale by owner that pops up on one of the for sale by owner sites, it gives you their phone number, it just automatically puts it in there. I'm not big on for sale by owners at all. Um, I think the for sale by owners and expireds are more of like a high pressure situation. Everybody's going after it. The owner really isn't in the mindset to really get to know you because you're just one of those other realtors that's kind of, it's tough. Um, but if you approach those guys the way I'm saying it works, like everything works, like internet leads, expires for sale by owners, door knocking, um, whatever avenue there is, it all works. If you figure out, you got to figure out what works for you. Um, a lot of people crush it with expires and for sale by owners and internet leads and all this stuff. Um, but for me, it's just not who I am. The, the, the thing that, the thing that, that, that I've really developed is, is how do you line up who you actually are? Because I'm sure most of you guys care about your clients and want to help them and we'll go over the top. You're hardworking, professional, dependable. You're everything that a client wants in a real estate agent. Um, but you haven't yet really been trained how to line that up, who you actually are as a caring, hardworking person with how you're communicating with your clients. See, you, on the inside, you feel you know, like you'll do anything for this person. But on the outside, it sounds like you just want to deal, right? Because you haven't been properly trained, like how, what to say, how to say, the people side of it. And I think that's what the real estate world is missing, is that how do you use your personality, your unique personality, to win the clients over? Um, you know, everybody that, there's a couple of things, one, business is unlimited like like there's no way that's why we're all here because if there was a way that one agent could do all the business I would already be doing it and none of you guys would be here <laughs> you know what I'm saying I would have figured it out already and you guys would we would not be here there's not I can't call every owner I can't do every deal right and there's so much of it it's just it's just overflowing that it's just a hundred percent unlimited now a lot of people are scared of, you know, what if this one dominant agent is dominating this neighborhood and, you know, I'm just not, I don't feel like I can get in there. How do I, you know, I'm scared. Well, again, that's that fear I was talking about. Anything you're scared of that's holding you back from taking action and stuff or fear about the market, all the fears, you have to eliminate all that because none of it matters, right? But, but the thing is, is even if there were a hundred agents going after a neighborhood with a hundred clients in it, that's still okay. Because it's the same thing with expires, with a lot of people calling the same people. The thing is they haven't talked to you yet. So you, you are unique. Nobody is like you. Your personality is different than everybody. That's what gives you the upper hand on everybody is the fact that you are you and nobody else can be you. Um, that's like, you know, all my coaching stuff. I've had other guys try to rip it off and go sell and all this. And I've had students come back and say, this guy's doing that and this. And I said, who cares? Because they're not me. It's not the scripts, even though they're probably the best out there. But it's not <laughs> that, it's that, right? It's, it's, that, it's that it's me. You know, it's the same thing with you guys when you're dealing with your clients. It's, it's you. They want you. You know, that's what you got to realize. So, well, I'll get you uh, the Red X thing. So it has the for sale by owners, it expires. But what I love about it is the Geo Leads. Geo Leads is the feature that you put an address in a bar, and then it finds up to 500 owners around that address in a snap of a finger. The phone numbers. Some of them are cell phone numbers. Tomorrow when I go live and do my calls, I'm literally just in the morning, I'm going to prepare. I'm literally just going to go to, I already have some numbers, but I'm not even going to use the numbers I have for whatever complex I'm doing. I'm going to start from scratch. I'm just going to get the numbers straight out of Red X and plug them into Mojo. It syncs. Mojo is a dialer, okay? So, so Red X, Geo Leads, that's my favorite thing in the world because 
I used to look up numbers on whitepages.com, and now you can just go Duke, 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 and get all the whole subdivision in a snap of a finger, okay? And it's better quality, way better quality. Um, so that's just amazing to me how 12 hours of my life is now an hour and a half because of technology. It really makes me excited. And it's amazing to me how many people are not taking advantage of this because voice to voice is king. Like conversation is the key to all closings. There's not a con there's not a closing that's ever happened without a conversation, right? Period. And so, if conversations king, like that's what you know. Why not have as many conversations as you can? All the social media and internet and all this is really set up to get to the conversation. I don't care if it's internet leads or wh wherever you know they emailed you. You still got to talk to them and find out what they want, what's going on with them. You know, you got to figure out what's going on there so you can help them. And they want to talk to you. You got to figure out if there's a working relationship. And so, conversation is everything. So, that's why I love this program because it finds the phone number. There's no excuses anymore. Like, it finds the phone numbers. And then they have a dialer. Red X has a dialer you can use to dial them, but it's, it, they're still working on it. It's, it has some bugs. So, I'm still using Mojo to dial. The dialer, it just automatically dials the numbers for you. You set it up, hit dial, and then it tells you to call a number on your phone, put a password in, and boom, it's on your phone. And then you just don't hang up your phone. You put your phone over there if you have a headset or just put it on speakerphone, and now you're working everything from your computer. You're hanging up and going to the next call. You're doing everything from your computer. And it'll call three people at once. Um, it'll triple dial, they call it. And that's really good for cold calling because some of the numbers are still going to be bad, and that triple dialer just cuts right through all the bad numbers and gets right to the good numbers. A lot of people think it's calling through people. What happens if this person answers and then da da da? Well, what happens is, is if you call three and this person answers, you start talking to them. And then if this person answers, you have a pre recorded message that says, Hey, hello. Hey, this is Ricky. Karuth with Three Max of Orange Beach. I'm in a bad spot. I'll call you right back. And then you keep talking to that person, and then when you're, when you're done with this call, it automatically calls that next person back, and it tells you that they listened to that message, and so you can say, hey, it's Ricky, can you hear me now? So here's the thing, whenever, like, you'll lose people like that because they'll hear that first message, and they'll think this is a weird, and so they won't answer that second call. So you'll lose some here and there, but you're chalking that up to quantity. Like, at some point, your business has got to be about a quantity of clients and a quantity of, at some point, you got to quit giving so much customer service and trying to convert every last lead and start doing projects that, 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 that help you acquire a huge quantity of relationships and clients. Like, you need thousands, you know? You need thousands to get where you really want to be. So quit playing around with these 10, 20, 30, 100, right? Just quit quit playing around with those all the time. Play around with them, but not eight, 40 hours a week, right? Carve out an hour or two where you're doing stuff like making cold calls and sending mass emails and doing big Facebook ad uh, campaigns and doing things that, that try to con connect with more people to get them into that sphere. And I do a weekly email. so. I, my whole thing is I try to get the email where they can start getting my weekly email. It's been going out every Wednesday since 07. And that's where the relationship is built. Because when the email's there every single Wednesday forever, and it's good, then it develops that relationship for me because they know through the email, I don't have to call them and check on them. They know through the email that I'm hardworking, dependable, professional, uh, you know, that I'm all the things that they want me to be, and I'm right there if they need something. So, Red X. Uh, also, if you call Red, there's a $150 startup fee. If you call them and tell them that I sent you, they, they waive that. And, or if you go to my website, zerodiamond.com, where everything is free, there's no hidden charges or nothing. You can get all my scripts, and you can, there's a link where you can sign up online for Red X and all that stuff. There's videos of me making calls, there's action plans, there's an entire coaching program I used to charge for that is now free because what, what happened is, is, is I woke up four or five months ago 
and I realized that I wasn't running my coaching business the same way that I'm coaching agents to run the real estate business. You know, I coach the agents that it's all about the relationship, not the deal, uh, you know, uh, how can I help you kind of thing. But then on the coaching side, I was sitting here doing all this stuff to try to get people to pay me a couple hundred dollars. And it just wasn't working. I was losing too many people that would get, that would follow me and get to the part where they had to pay. And they said, man, I really liked Ricky and everything he had going on, but, and I got a lot out of it, but I'm not going to pay. So now I'm going to go elsewhere and I lose them. Most people. And so I don't want that. I want to, I want to retain. I want to, I want to have lifelong relationships with all the agents in the world, you know, and, and help reduce the failure rate in the real estate industry really is kind of what my mission is, reducing the failure rate. And I think I can, I really believe I can do it because if I can, if I can tell people about the losing the deals is good because you get future time back and all this stuff, and when markets crashes, you can actually make more money because there's more opportunity of people that want to buy now and sell now. I really think I can help reduce the, the failure rate. I think there'll be agents that listen to me that end up not getting out of the business because they follow what I'm saying, you know, over time. Uh, yes, so going back to cold calling, um, I fully agree that relationships are the most important part of building your business. So when it comes to cold calling and in a couple of minutes trying to give them enough information of who you are and what you do without the commission breath, so to speak, is there some sort of advice that you have on that to build that relationship quickly enough that they... I'm going to run through my script really fast, but it's on my website. You guys can get it and print it out and all that stuff. But ring, 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 hello. Hey, Mr. Johnson. Hey, hey, yeah, this is Mr. Johnson. Hey, Mr. Johnson, this is Ricky Crew at the Remax of Orange Beach. How you doing today? Oh, I'm doing good. How about you? Oh, I'm doing good, too. I'm just enjoying the day. Isn't it gorgeous outside? Yeah, it's nice, nice. Okay, look, man, I don't want to take too much of your time today, but there was a house down the road that just sold, and I didn't know if there was anything I could do for you today. Oh, really? What it sell for? Uh, 100000 or whatever. Okay, yeah, no, I think we're good, man, but thanks. Okay, I got you. Well, look, is there an agent in the area that you would work with if you were to do something? Well, no. Okay, well, man, listen, I'm sure at some point, I don't know when, but at some point I'm sure you're going to want to buy or sell something. I would love the opportunity to work with you when that day comes. Would it be all right if I stayed in touch with you? Sure. Okay, cool. What's your email address? See how it, see how it, there, there's a big philosophy behind my phone script. There's two questions at the beginning. How are you doing? And isn't it gorgeous? Those are set up to not dive right into the real estate. Thing. It's, it's to loosen them up a little bit. Most agents go straight into, I'm calling all the, na- the people in your neighborhood. Or, I was calling to see if you might want to sell your property. Or, you know, some, some kind of real estate cliche, you know, script. But this, ask them how they're doing, and how about the day today? Isn't it awesome? Right? Or if it's raining. I'm just trying to stay dry. Isn't it nasty out there? or something about Christmas, or how was your new year, or something, right? Something that's not real estate that loosens them up. The two questions are set up to read them. Are they happy, sad, mad, glad? What's going on with them today? Are they in a hurry, are they busy? What, what's happening with them? You know, I'm trying to read what's going on with them so that, so that then from there, I, can, I know how to handle the rest of the call. And then, I got you. Well, look, I don't want to take up too much of your time today. I'm respecting the time, but I'm not asking them. I'm telling them. I'm fixing to tell you something. I don't want to take up too much of your time. But a house down the road just sold. Just listed. I just listed one. I just sold one. Whatever. And I didn't know if there's something I could do to help you. I'm not asking them by yourself. Right? It's a different approach. No? Okay, well, look, is there an agent in the area you would work with? That's the magic question because I'm pre-qualifying them. Do they already have a relationship? Is the mom an agent? Is their cousin? Is the best friend from high school? Because a lot of uh, agents will have a great conversation with people and think, I got a new client, but they don't realize that their mom is an agent and they'll never use you no matter how much they like you. And so this is a very important question. It, it, it's like, is the door open for us to have this lifelong relationship I'm about to begin with you via email forever? Or is your mom a realtor? Okay. Then it's like, okay, well, you don't? Well, look, I'm sure at some point, maybe five or ten years down the road, you're probably going to want to buy or sell something in the area. I'd love to work with you when that day comes. Is it okay if I stay in touch? 
So now I'm asking them if they want to stay in touch before I ask for the email because they're really, they're, they're, if you get that far in the conversation, they're going to say yes because they're thinking he's just going to call me every once in a while. They're not thinking private information, email, cell phone number, right? But then when you get them to commit to, you, to let you stay in touch, then it's like, okay, cool, what's your email address? And a lot has to do with your tone, how comfortable, see, your job is to make them feel comfortable. The only way you can make them feel comfortable is if you're comfortable. Because they're going to get, you know, it goes both ways. If you feel nervous, then they're going to feel nervous. And they're not going to want to do business with you. So it takes practice. It doesn't happen overnight. But if you watch the uh, videos of me making calls, and you see the people that hang up on me, you see the people that are busy, they're too busy to talk to me, I still get their email, because then I just start talking real fast. Say, okay, cool, I don't want to take too much time, but da 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 And I get the email. Um, watching those and seeing the tone and seeing, I, I'll talk really slow if I need to. Like, it's kind of I call a really old person who's country and I'm just, uh, you know, how you doing? You know, I, I mean, you know, like making them feel comfortable, like you're one of them, like that's my people, that's what you want. Like making them feel like that you're a friend or a family. You know, however you talk to a family member when you call them, get into that same mindset when you're calling, when you're cold calling people. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, when you do your emails every week and you send all those out, how do you, because I know you have many that you send out, do you send them out as a group thing or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Massive email to my entire database. Thirteen thousand people are in there. They get, they all get the same thing. You guys can go to zero to diamond .com. There's a link that says weekly email, and there's an example of my email like a couple weeks ago, and a video tutorial of me screen sharing, showing you how why I do it, and and walking you through how I build it on constant contacts. Yeah, on my back of my card. Yeah, the website's on there. How you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> Snuck in here. <laughs> He's always doing that. <laughs> How are your conversations going right now with when people are asking you about the market, about it slowing down, leveling out a little They bit? don't know. They don't know. They think the market's blowing up. Nobody knows. I have to tell them. If you're having that conversation, how does it go? Mm, they don't care. I mean, they. I tell them that the transactions. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah. They're like, okay. Well, I still want, you know, way more than I, way more than it's worth. You know? <laughs> they don't care. They, they, like, some of them think that I'm just trying to ambulance chase. Like, I'm just trying to like scare them so that they do something or whatever. Um, some of them do think that, but. The thing is, is I'm telling them the truth, and I'm not trying to predict. I'm just trying to inform. I see myself as an information provider first, a realtor second. And so if I'm just telling them what's going on, I feel it's my duty to tell them what's going on so that they can be informed as early as possible. And if they don't believe me, you know, or, you know, they kind of act like it's all good, but in the back of their mind, they don't, they think I'm just trying to pull the wool over their eyes or something. They'll find out in a year when things are flat, when things are selling for less than they were this year, you know. Um, I make predictions all the time about, okay, if you price it the listing of this, then this is going to happen, you know, and then that's what happens. Now, on the flip side, I get it wrong a lot too. They'll want to price it higher. I say no way in hell, and, and it sells in a day. Yeah. Things I think will never sell, sell in a day, and things I think will sell in a day, never sell. It's the craziest market, you know, I mean, like, real estate's just crazy. You can't predict anything, and you're not the god of real estate, pricing, comps, who cares what you think, it's the buyer who makes that decision. You know, you could have somebody come in that just really, really wants it for whatever weird reason that you don't know, it could be a trailer on, you know, like something that nobody, you know, but but his great grandmommy owned that property and he just got an inheritance from her. Now he wants every, you know, you never know what 
what uh, what's going to happen. So I take every listing, but I've set the expectations. I mean, I'm not going to take something that's like double the price or nothing. But when we're talking 10, 20 percent, I'm taking those. I try to talk them down, but if there's no talking them down, there's no talking them down. It's his property anyway. If he still wants to list it, even though I'm telling him this is a bad move, then that's what I want to do because I'm, I'm there for him, not for me. Not for the transaction, not for the deal. I want to do what he wants to do, and I try to let him know up front. This is me and you. This is this is your. We're we're basically married. Like you're gonna deal with me forever from now on. So it's straight up. Uh, anything else, guys? Yes. Um, well, I really get that you're building a pipeline, but what can what, what are the conversion numbers? I mean, like when you first started doing this program versus what it is now, I'm sure that there's a vast difference, but what can you expect if you do what you're saying in the short term, say? It's all mindset, right? Like understanding that closings happen every day, and then if you're talking to enough people, you're going to run into the people that want to do a deal today on top of the pe other people that don't want to do a deal but like you and that you're building this business for now and later at the same time. Like, if you understand that, you know, uh, there's just a really fine line and it comes with experience. Like, it's hard to say because everybody's different. Mm -hmm. You may start crushing it because you're such a people's person and you've heard everything I said and it really resonated and you absorbed it all and you, you're just doing it to a T. Or there may be 20% of you that still is going after the deal, needs a deal right now, and they can they can fill it, and you're losing. See, the, the part that, that gets me is the clients that you lose that you don't realize you lost. That's, that's, that's the tough part, because they didn't say, we don't like you, we don't want to deal with you. They said, yeah, you know, da-da-da, da-da-da. But in reality, in the back of their mind, they're thinking, I'd never do business with this guy. You know what I'm saying? But they're not going to come out and say it. It's like, do y'all have transaction fees over here? Yeah. Like, like, like the three or four hundred dollar yeah. transaction fee, doc fee, or whatever. Mm -hmm. We have it, but it's an option because you and I have it. So I don't charge it, right? Because if if I do a deal, and even if they sign the doc fee document, you know, it's still like a little, <laughs> it's still a little thorn. You know, it's like an extra little four hundred. Like, what is that for? Doc fee, right? And in my mind, I'm thinking, if I do that for every deal, there's gonna be a certain percentage of clients who don't come back to me, but don't tell me they didn't come back to me. That just was a little, they didn't like how that, they didn't like the feeling of that, so they didn't come back to me, but they didn't say it. And years later, they bought something, they sent referrals to another agent um, because they didn't like that. It's not worth it to me. The $400 isn't worth it to me to possibly lose the relationship because the relationship is worth lots of deals, referrals, past clients, repeat business. And so, and so it's the same thing. If there's 20% of you or 30 or 10 or 50 that's still going, and you may think you're doing everything I'm saying right, but you don't know subconsciously that tone and the way you're doing those words isn't quite there on the I'm all in on helping you and not myself. So I don't know. It's per person, right? But and and, and I really get that. I mean, you, you you can't predict or project. Yeah. All these people, but what were yours? Well, I was calling, making a hundred dials, talking to five people, and I would get like two that I connected with. You know. Um, now it's completely different because I'm just so good at it. I've made over a hundred thousand calls, right? So I, I just, now it's very high. You guys will see tomorrow when I do my live calls that of how calm and how the people just, they feel like they're family. We connect the first word. There's going to be some people that hang up on me, but, but there's going to, but, but most of them are going to engage, you know, into the conversation about the weather. You know, I'm enjoying the day, isn't it gorgeous? And they're going to say, oh, man, we're going to talk about the weather for two or three minutes. It's crazy where that, where that conversation goes. And how many agents are scared to try the weather thing because they feel like it's awkward?
But what's really awkward is saying, hey, how are you doing? And then saying, oh, good, good, okay. Just call me see if you might want to sell your house. That's awkward. Going right into a sale, right? There's nothing more awkward than that. A lot of people tell me that weather part of the call, because I skip the weather part of the call if I say, how are you doing? And they say, oh, I'm busy. What can I do for you? Then I'm not going to do the small talk. I'm going to go, oh, okay, cool. Well, listen, I don't want to take too much of your time today, but the house down the road sold in. They're saying, do you all that, I'm gonna start talking real fast, I'm gonna skip that part. If they're really adamant about I'm busy, I don't have time for this. Um, but a lot of agents that I coach will say, you know, I was doing the weather thing, and then I'm calling, and then the prospect, I can, I can, I can sense it that, that they're busy. They didn't say they're busy, I can just feel like they're busy. They're not busy, that's just the agent in their mind saying I don't, I'm scared of this part of the call. Or maybe they did kind of act like they're busy, but that, that's, a, that's a time where you need to use the weather part of the call to loosen them up. Because if that prospect's a little tight, you know, like, uh, who is this kind of thing, um, that's a time to use that part of the call to loosen them up. And then and, and instead of you thinking that they're busy, going straight into the real estate part of the call and then making it really awkward. And then you may lose that client that would have been your client in five years that gave you seven more referrals over the next 15 years, you may lose. See, one client is very valuable, you know? And so you gotta be a master at understanding the long-term ROI of each client and the little nuances that, that lose them because there's so many agents out there. Like, like, after they say, no, not interested, never say, well, who do you know? <laughs> right? They might want to buy or sell. That's a, that's a mainstream trained uh, approach. But what it does is it says, okay, Mr. Owner, you can't help me. So who else do you know that might be able to help me? After you make that first initial uh, call, what do, Never. You try to, do you ever try to meet with a person? Yeah, if I have a good call yeah. and, and I'm feeling it, the face to face. I'm feel if I'm really feeling it, you know. And I know this is hard for women who are talking to men, right? Or even men talking to women. But I like to try to go for a lunch appointment. Having lunch with sellers who are owners. Owners are buyers and sellers, by the way. They're the best source of buyers. Buyer leads are not. Having as many lunches as you can have with property owners who aren't ready to buy or sell right now should be your thing. You should be going all in on how many lunches can I have with property owners in the area who don't want to do anything right now and start developing that relationship. Because remember, market share is how many real, whoever, whatever agent has the most real relationships with property owners in the area, right? So anything you're doing in the name of that, you're developing your market share. So now the great thing about when the market crashes, all the agents go away, they leave all that market share open for you. You can go in there and grab all that market share and when the market come, comes back up, you blow up. That's what happened to me. What was your question? That was just, that was it, meeting face to face. So. Yeah, I love the lunch thing. Yeah, yeah, anytime I can squeeze a lunch in there. See, a lot of my clients are out of state, out of town, because I'm on the beach, condos. And, I'll, and sometimes if I'm really, even if it's a past client, I'm like, well, when are you guys coming down next? You know? And then they'll say, May 23rd, the week of the May 23rd will be down. I said, okay, cool, I'm gonna put you down. I'll call you the week before, and I'll see if we can't get up. I'll take you somewhere nice to eat for lunch, you know, or something. But I do this, lunches all the time. Is this after the second or third conversation you have? Do you, do you ever I only have one people? conversation. <laughs> that first initial. That's it. Okay. Then the email develops a relationship for okay, me, and they fine. call me. See, it creates a business where everybody's calling me. I don't have to chase them. They call me when they get ready. And so that, then I can just focus on more and more and more, more and more and more, quantity. You know, it's like, it's all about speed and quantity until you get in front of a client. Then it's all about quality. Then the world stops. It's all about them. You know, you're making your calls. You've got the dollar going. You're going through 100 calls. You know, blows through five of them, and then boom, it picks one up. Now everything stops. I don't care if we talk for three hours. Whatever I can do to help this person, I'm, I'm gonna do it. So if I, if I spend all day talking to this one person, I didn't make my 100 calls because the 30th call talked to me for four hours, 
I'm okay with that. But when I'm through with the call, now uh, I gotta go. I gotta get. I gotta get more. I gotta do something, right? So it's about you gotta find that balance between quantity and speed and quality. Super important. Does the Red X um, automatically set them into your email campaign, or do you have to actually transfer that? I use Constant Contact for my emails. So when they tell me their email, I just write it down. And then I'll have a list of them. And then at the end of the call session, I'll go through and I'll send personal emails to all of them and say, thank you for your time on the phone. If there's anything I can do for you, let me know. Click here for the new listings in your area or something. I'll give them something in that first little initial email. But then they just go in my email database and I'll just type them in at the end of the day. Red X could have something. I don't know. I, don't, I just I use it to find numbers. That's all I do. And then I use Mojo to call them. And I think Mojo does do some emailing stuff. I don't know all the features. But I just use all the tools that I use. I just use what I need, you know, and whatever works. You know, you gotta put put the put your own puzzle together. Are there certain days and times that you make your calls? No, I think pre-qualifying and trying to figure out when people are gonna pick up is just a big excuse not to call. <laughs> um, I hate that. I think that you want to make calls, just make calls. I make them in the morning between nine and twelve because that's when my mind is the sharpest. I want to be on top of my game. I want to be the best Ricky I can be. I want to be funny, energetic. I want to be witty. I want to be the best I can be. And after lunch is when your mentally start to become a little fatigued. Like the longer the day goes, the more mentally fatigued you are, and the less you're on, the less of you know, less you're on your game. So I like nine to twelve, Monday through Friday. I don't. I've never made calls on the weekends or after hours. A lot of people have better uh, pickup rates after hours and on the weekends. You know, muggle talk, uh, go do it. You know, whatever works, but don't contemplate about should I call then, should I call now, just do it, right? Is that it, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? More questions. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking how you go in, you plug in an address and you have your uh, 500 numbers that come up for that area. Yeah. When you go in to make your calls the next time and you put an address, mm -hmm. how is it not going to pick up some of the same people and how do you know not to recall? It's okay. You can call them again. Why would, why would you care about that? If you've already spoken to them once, I think what she's going to do. I don't know. Talk, talk to them again. Say, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, oh, you own this property too. Cool. How, how, are, you, how are you doing since yesterday? I mean, I don't know. Like, like <laughs> seriously, like, like, like roadblocks that a lot of people think are roadblocks or get stomped are really not even a road bump. Like, people that, you know, say, where'd you get my number? You know, or should I leave a voicemail? Or all these little questions that kind of hold people up is just, it's just not even worth, like, it's, you, you, you become, like, when you're a people person and you get those people skills and you're developing relationships, you're really good at just smoothing stuff over. And in real estate, you're gonna run into stuff where people stump you, like uh, ask you questions you don't know the answer to. You just have to be a, a master at not getting nervous about getting put in those situations, and when you do get put in one of those situations, just smooth it right over. If you accidentally call somebody who has their property listed, okay, cool, I didn't see it, let me see, oh yeah, here it is, cool, yeah. Who's your agent? Oh, I know them, you're in good hands. Look, I'm gonna try to sell this for you. Let me, I'm going to send this out to some people tomorrow, you know, tell your agent, I said, hey, I'll talk to him if I run into a buyer, have a good day. You know, like just coming up with, just smoothing it over and being yourself and being honest. Like I think honesty is a big thing with smoothing things over. A lot of people are scared or embarrassed about what actually happened. I accidentally called you, I didn't mean to kind of thing. But that's actually a good line right there. I accidentally called you, I didn't mean to. Like. Being honest about what happened really is is a good way to smooth stuff over most of the time. Do you leave voicemails and texts? Yep. You do? Text? Yes. No, I don't text. Uh, probably a good idea. I, I'm, I'm still very old school. Like, like there was no Facebook, Zillow, nothing, none of that when I started. And when I figured out phone calls and how it all worked and the email, the weekly email thing, and I found something that really worked. Like I said in the beginning, I'm really good at figuring out what works and then going all in on that. 
and I'm kind of stuck in my ways with it, right? I should maybe do some texting, but I'm so busy. It's not like I'm trying to like create business. I have so much, I have more than I can handle. If I were brand new, then yes, I would be trying every CRM, every text messaging thing, every, you know, I would be trying all these things to see what, what the best avenue for me. I just started doing social media last year, like in 2016. I mean, 17, like, like just started doing social media in the January of 2017. You can go back and look at my Instagram when it started or when I created my group or when I started posting on my per personal profile, it was January of 2017. Until then, I didn't even look at it because I was, I, I, I mean, in 2014, I sold a hundred properties. Um, I had something that worked. So I'm kind of one of these guys, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. So I'm just going to continue crushing it over here until this doesn't work, and then I'll find something else. So I haven't explored every little avenue there is because I'm so busy crushing it and selling so many properties. But, but yeah, I think it's something you can try. But the voicemail is just like, hey, this is Ricky Crew through Max Speech. I'll just mm -hmm. call you about whatever. Give me a call back as soon as you can, my phone number. I use the voicemails as a branding tool. They hear my name. They hear my company. They hear my number. They hear what I'm about. Chances are they're not going to call me back, but at least they heard my name and stuff. The mojo. Um, but then my buddy told me about Red X. He was like, dude, I've been calling numbers off Red X, and some, some of those people are asking me how I got their cell phone numbers. I was like, really? Find some cell phone numbers? He's like, yeah. I said, done. So I went there, and I started playing around with it, and boom. People were like, how'd you get my cell phone number, and all this and that. And I was like, this is the highest. And I've tried Cole. I've tried... Um, Several of them. Mojo actually has one, and I've tried that. Um, not nothing compared to Red X's quality. I haven't found one that actually finds cell numbers, and they're all evolving. You know, I mean, they'll all, I guess, eventually get to where it's the high. You know, but but yeah. Um, and when I found that out, so I've been using them ever since. Uh, what else do I use? Um, yeah. Uh, do you sponsor ads on LinkedIn as well or just Facebook? Just Facebook because LinkedIn's business, you know, it's more realtors than clients. Yeah, commercial property at all or just residential? Just, I've sold, I've sold some commercial, uh, mostly go for condos, you know, but I've sold everything. I've sold apartment complexes, you know, beachfront development properties, you know, I've sold, I, I have two developments in Foley that I'm listing agent of. Um, you know, I've got all kinds of stuff, but I focus on Gulf Front properties, but no, I haven't actually LinkedIn's another thing. I just started like, like a couple weeks ago. I just started, I made a profile and started posting there. Um, so I'm still trying stuff, you know, like Twitter, never did Twitter. Now I'm doing a little tweet a day or something, you know, just to, and that's like on the decline, but there's still half, there's still 300 million user monthly users there and so that's something it's bigger in other areas for sure yeah 500 million uh on linkedin every month that's a lot of people um so um uh, it's very interesting to to watch the the way all this is going with with the social media side of things and i think it's just like the market how there's new things coming out like transactions being down and prices and you can watch it and see the changes and be on top of those changes for your clients and bring them value. That's how you bring them value, is, is telling them what's going on with the market before anybody else knows about it. Same thing with social media. Every time they come out with a new feature on Instagram or Facebook, you should be trying it out to see what, to see how it, because when they do new features, there's a lot of exposure because they want to see how it works. It was like when Facebook first did the Facebook Live my buddy did a Facebook Live, just like we all do a Facebook Live, but he had like 20,000 views in like an hour because it was during the first week or so. It's like they really pushed the new things in the beginning. And so if you can be on the front end of a new thing that one of them are doing, you could get a lot of exposure real quick, you know, and all those people saw you. You know, and then and then in two weeks, you don't you can't get that same exposure, but two weeks before all those people saw you. It's like Instagram stories is really, uh, is really catching a lot of traction. I mean, that's turning into something big. And the Instagram story ads, those are very underpriced right now. 
that's something that's very, that's something that's, that, that would be very lucrative. I, you, you know, that's something that you, you guys should look into as far as the ads go. It's something that's kind of on the forefront that they're trying to really figure out if it works or not. Instagram ads. And you have to create those in the Facebook ad manager. And it pushes it to both. Yeah. yeah. No, don't push it to both. You can. You can win can. To where the stories, though? Oh, I'm sorry. That's what yeah. I'm saying, the stories, yeah. Well, I mean, no, before we know I, mean uh, uh -huh. I, I could talk all day about social with the different little things I've learned and stuff. I mean, I think, I think one, I guess if I can say one thing about it, I think that having the Facebook page and having the Instagram account linked to the Facebook page and then running ads to your client database on Facebook concurrently with the Instagram is big. I think having those things linked and then running a Facebook ad on your Facebook page and making a custom audience with all the email addresses you have where Facebook will find all the profiles of all those email addresses and create a custom audience and you, all your dollars are going to your clients that already get your emails and already know you, I think that's big. Because some of those clients aren't open in the emails but they see your Facebook. And then some of those people aren't up in the emails and aren't on Facebook, but they're on Instagram. And so you're, you're hitting all three areas, email, Instagram, Facebook, for that database. You know, and then the people that are open in the emails and are on Facebook and are on Instagram are seeing you in all three places. And it just gives you even more credibility in the market and what you're doing and your professionalism and all that stuff. I think that's big. <laughs> Once you make a call and if they don't answer, you leave a voicemail. Do you continue to call daily? You just no, okay. never call them again. Okay. What was the question? Sorry. Once if you know, once you call them, <coughs> if they don't answer, you leave a voicemail. Do so you continue to call them? Uh, and you say they're a, they're that they are a notorious non-answer. Okay. They're never going to answer. Right, and you're wasting every dial on them trying to get them to magically answer that you could spend calling a new person. Remember what I said about one the RO of just one client, how important it is. And so if you try to call that person back that didn't answer, let's say you call them back three time three more times over a four month period, though that's three more dials that could have been three new people, right? And if you would have connected with say one of those three people, you know that's big. Like you don't understand how big it is. And so, like the little efficiencies like that is, is, is why I've got such a big database, because I understand. Now, if I took all the people that, that never answered and call all them back, yeah, I may get a couple to answer here and there, but I'm working, the, I'm working the percentages. I'm working the numbers, you know? Anything, Blake? This is Blake, by the way. Hey, Blake. Bring that up for you. When you say you're overwhelmed right now, is that when you get to a certain point, like 100, 200 people that you can actively work with, or do you kind of more focus? Or you just don't, you're constantly adding to your database? Like yeah, that. I'm constantly adding to my database. Yeah. Uh, like last year, um, I made zero calls. Mm -hmm. It was the best year I've ever had in real estate. Because you've built relationships. So, so momentum is, is one of the biggest tools in real estate. When you get, it's like pushing a truck. It's hard to get going. But once you get it going, you know, you're going. But if you stop, now you've got to start all over again. And when you get it going and it's, and it's pushing easy, that's when you really got to take it to another level and push even harder to get that momentum really going. And I've just done that for so long that I've got to a point where it just kind of got out of control. And so many people are calling me wanting to buy and sell and referrals and all that stuff. I didn't have time to do. Now, and when I got there, see, there, there's, to me, there's two classifications of time. There's the execution time and there's the, there's the education time. When you're trying to, to, to be the best and, and, and learn everything you can learn, okay, you got that time where you're executing, you know, where you're making the calls, you're showing the property, you're, you're going on your appointments, but then you got the other time where you're reading and you're listening and you're researching and you're trying to figure out what the other agents are doing and you're trying to be the best, right? But then when you get to a certain point where you've reached the top, you know, that's where I hit last year, where I'm not trying to figure it out anymore. I got it figured out. I call people, I create relationships, I put them in my database, I send weekly emails, I help them for the rest of their life, I go over the top for everybody, and everybody comes back to me. 
So I figured it out. So now I'm still executing, but I'm not doing any more education time because I've already learned as much as I want to learn right there. So now all this has opened up the education. That's when I started writing, speaking, coaching, you know, Facebooking, you know, that's why I started all that because I had to fill in that gap. I can't just sit around, you know. I could have filled it up with more execution of real estate, but that's not me. I want to go to, I don't want to just stay where I'm at. I want to go higher and higher and higher. So the overwhelmness, I think, comes from all the referral, just all the business I'm getting, just it's getting, just coming at me, you know, wow. I'm trying to write two books I published last year and set up speaking engagements and create a website with an awesome coaching program, doing all this stuff at once, making YouTube videos and stuff. So I stay overwhelmed. I think everybody has a different size cup, which represents how much you can handle. Everybody has a different size of how much you can handle. You might be able to only handle you know, two pendings and five listings at once. It takes up all your time. I can do 20 or 30 under contracts and 100 listings, right? And I'm, and I'm just not even breaking a sweat. Everybody has a different level that they can handle. The problem with most of you guys is you haven't went out there and overwhelmed yourself with enough business to get to the point where you're overwhelmed to know where your breaking point is. And what you got to do is, is you got you to you say, I'm not scared of this. I'm going to overwhelm myself. And then... I'll know where my breaking point is, and now I can throttle back and stay right there where I'm doing as much as I can do, and that's when you reach your full potential. And so that's just what I've done. I, I, my, my cup is just overflowing all the time because I've worked so hard to keep it full, you know? It's all a mindset.